Today, I'm at the Gathering at Five Metals, and we're going to be actually doing a demonstration event this weekend. It's not something we normally do, uh, but we're going to be building an earthen oven and then using it. Uh, today, which is setup day, this is Thursday, the day before uh, the school day, I'm actually setting up all the tents and putting together the table. And I thought you might want to see how the table part is put together. Many people ask about the construction of the table for your earthen oven, and there's no one way to do it, but this is the, um, this is the table that we're using today at this event. I'll go through the steps so you can see exactly what's going on with the table. I've got some big six by sixes that I cut for the corners. We've got uh, two by tens that I just made a frame to go around the outside edge, and then internally, these are uh, two by fours that will actually hold the weight of the oven and it's secured at all the ends. And I've got some center um, reinforcements to make sure that we've got enough uh, weight bearing in the center because that's where all the weight is gonna be. Once your table's constructed, now we're gonna start putting together the layers uh, before we put our, our oven on. The first layer uh, on top of this, uh, on top of these two by fours is a sheet of OSB or half inch plywood. Next, I've got a sheet of, um, of cement board that I'm gonna put on top of that. Now that our cement board is on, we can put on a layer of sand and we want about an inch and a half or two inches of sand and then we can set our bricks. You're probably gonna have uh, cracks at the edges of your boards. You don't want the sand to pour out. So you'll just wanna fill up the crack with a little bit of mud. I've got about 150 pounds of sand up on top of this table and now I'm gonna just level it out to make sure it's nice and flat before I put the bricks on. Lay the bricks out on their faces, not the thick way, but actually the thin way. And I laid this table out specifically so that the bricks should uh, completely fill the area. Basically, I'm done with the table. The bricks are all laid out nice and flat. This oven's not made with a sand form, but with an actual wood form, this is just a little strips of green ash, very bendy material, and we just turned this into a frame. I did do a, a bottom frame here of wood so that the circumference was nice and round. We put a uh, one round strip all the way around the outside and then built the basket. And we've got the door here that will we'll build actually right into the oven so that the door fits exactly uh, into the, the openings. Our, our frame is already built up. Uh, there's lots of gaps, so I'm gonna put the cloth strip over the top of it so that the, uh, so the clay doesn't go through it. This oven took about 375 pounds of cob material, and that was made from 225 pounds of dry sand, 85 pounds of dry clay, and 65 pounds of water, all stomped into the right consistency with a little bit of straw added in for some strength. We made this oven with just one big thick layer instead of the two layers that we've used in past videos. And the wall thickness on this, it was about two and a half to three inches thick. Okay, it took a couple of hours, uh, but I've got this thing all put together and now we're gonna speed dry this oven. I'm gonna start a little fire on the inside and uh, we'll see if we can get this dry enough to bake in by tomorrow morning still had spare time and some cob left over so I went ahead and put together a small oven right there on the ground a lot like the 24-hour oven I had some uh, some willow branches and it was a perfect little spot so there's a second oven there I'll make sure to put a link down in the description section of this video uh, to the 24-hour oven video so you can get a little bit more in-depth on this so this oven I uh, finished this one at about 11 o'clock it's uh, probably about th uh, three or four o'clock now. Um, and I've had a very small fire going in it and it's really toughened up. Uh, so it, I can st start putting a bigger fire in it. I was a little concerned about the bottom edge being soft. So I actually put a little bit of coals right around the outside edge. So it's hardened up right here at the bottom so that it, so that it doesn't kind of slump down as I heat this up a little bit more but really it is drying out in a hurry so we should easily be able to bake in this tomorrow so it's looking good and the fire it's I'm gonna start building it up a little bit more and a little bit more and probably burn this out 
the, the inner uh, woodwork by say six or seven o'clock tonight. So the little oven here, uh, I wanna heat this up even faster. So I'm putting a little bit of straw around the outside edge and lighting it on fire to dry out this uh, outer shell so I can cook in this in a hurry. We're gonna let these ovens dry out overnight, but you could cook in them even now. So yesterday we built this and I kept a warming fire in it till even right until the evening and just left coals in it overnight. It cooled down to about 80 degrees or 100 degrees uh, by the time I got up this morning and I started firing it back up right away. And uh, we've actually been, uh, this has got something baking in it right now. So it only took a couple hours really to get going. And this oven, um, I was real careful about how I heated it up. So even at, we're at less than 24 hours right now. The oven's got very few cracks and it's really holding together really well. So here's the second oven I built. Same thing. Uh, it was still nice and warm. I left it uh, kind of uh, with coals in it overnight. And this one, because of the way it's made, uh, because the, uh, the willow branches go into the ground and the dome will expand, but the ground can't expand underneath it. And it's anchored by those willows. They just naturally are gonna crack right over the top because it's just like a loaf of bread that expands over the top, but the, but the bottom isn't expanding. So you just have to live with these cracks. They're, they're a temporary oven, so the crack really isn't gonna change how it's gonna work that much. It's still gonna work just fine. This is just a temporary weekend oven. Well, today we're gonna make a very simple wheat and bread. It's a whole wheat bread. We've got uh, some barm or yeast, warm water, a little bit of salt. We'll work that together into a sponge let that rise for a little while um, and then I'll, I'll come back and add additional flour to it and work it into a nice soft dough uh, for our bread ovens over here. So if your door doesn't really fit well, especially in a short-term oven like this, and you need to do, you need to kind of work fast and get this door to seal, you can use some bread dough, or in fact, this is just flour and water kind of mixed up into a Play-Doh kind of consistency and seal the door so that it stays warm and that'll, that'll help hold the heat in. We thought we'd take a quick look to see just how the bread turned out. Let's crack it open and see if it is finished on the inside. It looks Look like that. it was perfect. That's beautiful. Yeah. Got a nice structure to it. There's a little bread, or a little butter, I'm sorry, for you. I just need a little bit. I don't like that much. Whoa, mm -hmm. wow. Mm -hmm. That crust is gorgeous. Crackly, crispy. Nice structure. Yep. Chewy on the inside. That's a bit, it's a little dense. I wouldn't complain about that. Not not bad at it all. It was very cold this weekend. It's very hard to get the proof on these. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Get them to build up, but mm. turned out gorgeous. And they're delicious. That is excellent bread. Even if you can't build an oven to do it in a Dutch oven, mm -hmm. we could have, some mm -hmm. of the loaves we've done have been in a Dutch oven this weekend. Less than 12 hours later, if you do it right, you can, you can bake in the oven. It is yeah. an amazing thing. Yes. So there you have it. It's our experiment this weekend. Uh, I came in, we came in on Thursday. I put the table down that I already had built. On Friday morning, I started at nine o'clock. We built the oven. Mm -hmm. We were ready, at, we dried it out and ready to bake in it less than 12 hours later. Mm -hmm. And the next day, we baked bread all Saturday. We can bake bread all Sunday again and then take the oven apart, leave it there at the event someplace. Make sure to get permission first. 
um, about discarding your your soil but really it's just soil it, it's going to it's going to break down uh, with rain and nobody will know it's there in a year or so it's a great thing fun everybody's interested in food everybody loves bread so it's such a great project i hope you get a chance and i really want to thank you for watching so a while back we did a short series on food preservation, and this really goes right along with that. Uh, pickled eggs are a great way to preserve your eggs for the future. It's important to remember that food preservation techniques like this, well, if you do them improperly, it can be bad for you. Uh, you, can, you can be poisoned by it. So I really recommend storing these in the refrigerator when you're done with them. Pickling eggs is quite easy. This recipe comes from Charlotte Mason's 1778 cookbook, The Lady's Assistant. I'm starting with a dozen eggs. There are different ways to hard boil eggs. Uh, and for store-bought eggs like these eggs, the best way to get them hard boiled properly, I guess, would be to put these into cold water and allow that water to come up to boiling. As soon as it comes up to boiling, you take that pan off, you cover it, and leave it for 13 minutes. Fresh eggs, on the other hand, can be very difficult to peel once they're boiled. So probably the best way to boil these would be to get your uh, water boiling first, then put the eggs down into your boiling water, uh, let it return to a boil, and boil them for 15 minutes. So regardless of how you boil your eggs, uh, once they're done boiling, you need to cool them down quickly. So put them in a bath of cold water or even icy water. So before we get started, you are going to need a vessel, something to store your eggs in. I'm gonna be using one of our uh, large storage jars. Next, we're going to need two cups of malt vinegar boiled. You could use uh, distilled vinegar or cider vinegar, but really I think malt vinegar is the best for this recipe. To our heated vinegar, we're going to add some black peppercorns, a few blades of mace, and some sweet herbs like uh, thyme and rosemary. So modern pickled eggs that you find today in the, at the grocery store, in the gel, deli or whatever, are usually magenta um, or very bright red, and that uh, coloring is usually accomplished with beet juice. But all the English recipes that we usually find the pickled eggs from in the 18th century, those are actually uh, made red with not beet juice, but cochineal. Cochineal was popular in the 18th century for dyeing food and other things. Uh, it is a, a Central American scale bug that grows on cactus plants. Um, while it was popular in the 18th century, it's still popular today, but it goes by a different name. They call it carmine. The cochineal is very easy to use. I took about a teaspoon of it, put it in my little mortar and pestle, and ground it up till it's a nice fine powder, and then put that into a little bit of cloth and wrapped it up. And this little bundle I'll put into our, uh, our mixture with the vinegar and let it steep. Now it's as simple as uh, loading up our jar with our uh, already boiled eggs. Now let's remove the, uh, the little sachet that has the cochineal in it. Uh, it really, it's steeped long enough to transfer that dye into the vinegar solution. And finally, we'll just pour this uh, warm vinegar solution right over the top of our eggs. We wanna make sure they come all the way up to the top, cover up the eggs and we're gonna stir the eggs just a little bit. Um, she calls for this in the recipe so that the dye covers the eggs completely and gets an even coating. Now they're ready to store in the refrigerator. Uh, you should keep these for at least 10 days for them to complete their pickle, but they will stay good for months. Well, here are our pickled eggs and uh, they look great. You know, in the 18th century, these would have made uh, a perfect garnish. Regardless, they would be spectacular on the table. There you go, look at that. We've got a very nice sort of mahogany color through the whole thing, and the, uh, the yolk is colored and uh, nice and dark there. They are, they look spectacular. Let's see what they taste like. Hmm. Wow. Much better than I was expecting, much more mild but with a nice little pickly flavor to them. So these turned out fantastic. They look great and they taste great. 
And they're really, they're so simple that you really need to try them. And thanks for watching. Today we're doing an episode on soldier's food and basically the most simple and primitive uh, soldier's food. And we'll be concentrating on a, a couple of pieces right out of Joseph Plum Martin's memoirs. Well, before we get started, I've got uh, Josh collecting more firewood uh, and I want to read to you a couple sections out of Joseph Plum Martin's memoirs. Joseph Plum Martin was a, uh, a Revolutionary War soldier, and after the war he wrote a very detailed memoir that has a lot of uh, description about his food and eating while he was a soldier. Here's that first section. So this is from the campaign of 1776. He says, We found our invalids consisting of the sick and the lame and the lazy, uh, they had obtained some fresh beef. Where the commissioners found the beef or the men found the commissioners in this time of confusion, I do not know, nor did I stop to ask. They were broiling the meat on small sticks, Indian style, around blazing fires made of dry chestnut rails. The meat, when cooked, was as black as coal on the outside and as raw on the inside as if it had not been near the fire. I asked no questions for conscience sake, but fell to and helped myself to a feast of this raw beef without salt or bread. That's a, an amazing little piece, amazing little story uh, that he gives us. And, you know, that, that leads me to talking about raw beef. Soldiers' rations were uh, very typically or supposed to be a pound of meat a day. Uh, many times, or most of the times, that was listed as either fresh beef or uh, pork, and they probably meant salt pork at the time, but fresh beef, not salt beef or corned beef or other uh, kinds of beef, but fresh fresh beef. And uh, most of the references that Joseph Plum Martin actually gives in his book about uh, his rations, most of the time the meat he had was fresh beef, although he always complained about it being underweight. It was supposed to be a pound, and he says rarely a pound. Um, and that it was half bones. Well, here's our uh, beef ration today. We've got some nice fresh beef. Uh, this looks really good compared to an 18th century beef. He was always complaining that it was very lean, uh, that in fact, that sometimes it was transparent. But today uh, we're going to cook some of this up. We're gonna cut it into little nuggets and cook it on the fire with some nice fresh sticks. Josh has prepared these sticks uh, so that we can start getting our meat cooked over the fire. So while Josh is tending to the meat over the fire, let me read you this uh, second excerpt. This is a very interesting piece. I like this. He says, we drew a day's ration of beef and flour. This uh, was called a pound of each. The flour perhaps was not far from its nominal weight, but the beef was as it always was in such cases, and indeed in all the others in the army, not more than three quarters of a pound. And that at best half bone. And how was it cooked? He says, why, as it was usually as when we had no cooking utensils with us, that is, the flour was laid upon a flat rock and mixed up with cold water and then daubed upon a flat stone and scorched on one side while the beef was broiling in the fire on a stick. And this was the common way of cookery when on marches. And we could get anything to cook, that is. And that is the mode that we used at this time. This was the campaign of 1777. So there you have a very, very simple, what, what's it like when you're on the march and you don't have any cooking utensils and you have to cook up your food? So this may sound familiar to you. Uh, we've done ash cakes and fire cakes in a couple of different episodes, but in this one, he talks about actually cooking them on a flat stone. So that's what we're gonna try today. Well, I took part of our uh, flour ration and I just mixed it with water. I don't have anything else. Uh, they weren't, uh, he wasn't issued anything but just straight flour. So we're just gonna mix it up and make a nice uh, soft paste. And our big rock here is nice and flat. And we'll just try cooking it on that. Uh, 
uh, kicks like this are, are very challenging on a rock. The rock was very hot, so uh, when I put the, the flower on it, it kind of stuck right to it. But that gives me the ability to, uh, to move this rock up into position so that they can get heat on the top side. But you got to be really careful. This, hot, this rock is extremely hot and uh, it's very difficult, it's very heavy. So you don't want to hurt yourself if you're trying something like this. Well, here is our uh, cooked up meat. Josh did a great job on the, the meat pieces and uh, the, uh, the bread pieces. Well, we'll see how that turns out. They were a little challenging to get off that rock, you could see, but uh, they, look, they look good. So let's give this a chance. Let's give it a try. Oh, I want to try this is cooked exactly like they would have done that in the 18th century. What do you think about that rock cake? Uh, nice rock cake. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so the bread, that's a bit challenging and you really have to, well, hope your rock is clean. You don't get too many um, bits of rock dust rock in <laughs> And without any salt, these are very plain. Oh yeah. But, you know, if you take them off before they're hard and black like this, they're, they're not bad. I'm gonna try out one of these pieces of meat. It looks great. And, mm. It's very good. You mm. almost wish you were back there in the 18th century so you could try out some of Joseph Plum Martin's cooked meat over the fire. It could be worse, let me tell you. Oh yeah. This is great stuff. What you really need to have with this is, is the, the fat and the meat that, that gives a little bit of flavor to the flour because otherwise it's, the flour is really rough. But together, it's, it's pretty good. You can make right. it on this. And you can imagine how much better it would be with salt He's always oh, yeah. complaining that he doesn't Little have salt. enough salt. Um, he's constantly complaining he doesn't have any sauce. So he probably oh, yeah. means vegetables or anything else to go with it. Like any type of sauce would have yeah. really help push this up a, a whole lot. And it's pretty good to begin with. Right. You can imagine that he didn't have these rations very often. He was very often complaining about not having any food. But when you have it, even mm. if you don't have any utensils and you're on the march, mm. all you've got is your fresh, fresh ration all we had was um, a one knife to sharpen our sticks with. Yep. Sometimes you even hear about them using their bayonets. Yeah. You may, even without a knife, you can use a bayonet. Although some your officers might get uh, <laughs> upset about using your bayonet <laughs> as a cooking device, but I'm sure they did back then too. <laughs> right. So you can use your bayonet to cook uh, your meat on, and nothing but a flat rock, or even if you don't have a rock, you can make the fire cakes. Make sure to check out. Our other episodes, our pound of meat episode, where we talk about rations, and our fire cake episode, where we make the fire cakes right on the coals. It's actually a little easier than uh, doing it on the rock like this, uh, but this is equally, uh, equally a great method. Well, we need to finish this up so we can get back on the march. Give me another one. There you go. Hmm, that's excellent. Oh, yeah. So before we get started with this Twelfth Night cake, let's talk just a little bit about the Twelfth Night itself. Yeah, you know, when I was a kid, uh, we sang the song, 12, 12, days, right. of 12 days of Christmas. Had no idea what it was about. It right. was a fun song, but it's, it didn't make any sense to me. I wanted 12 days of Christmas. Sure, don't we all? Yeah, yeah. but, but in, here in America, there's the 25th of December. Right, and then it's over. Right, right. So the, the 12 days of Christmas actually mm -hmm. refers to a, a period or a season mm -hmm. uh, that they, uh, uh, they've celebrated for centuries. Right. And it's still, still celebrated. I mean, you'll find that in other cultures, even in Great Britain, I think they probably do a little bit more of that than certainly we do. We don't do any of that. Right. Um, it, was, it was the period of time between Christmas and Epiphany when the wise men were supposed right, to have shown right. up. So that's Twelfth Night, but there's some special Twelfth Night sort of happenings that go on, aren't there? Right. Or 12 days. You know, in researching this, um, I was finding extra culinary references mm -hmm. to Twelfth Night. Right. A letter from a mother to her son, we've sent you this Twelfth Cake, we assume we don't have to give you directions on how to use it. Um, uh, we see these pictures of these massive cakes in right. some 18th, 18th century illustrations. Right. Yeah, enormous. One picture, two guys had to carry it. But interestingly, we don't find recipes that are right. specifically called Twelfth Cakes 
or Twelfth Night Cakes. But I don't think that's strange. I mean, we don't have a special, you don't go into a cookbook today and say, this is a wedding cake or here's a birthday cake, this is a birthday cake recipe. No, we just make a cake recipe and we call it a birthday cake. The first recipe that I have found was in 1807, uh, John Mallard's third edition of his uh, The Art of Cookery, where he actually gives it a title, uh, a name, Twelfth Cake. But that doesn't mean that tw that was the first time, no. you know, that was the invention of the Twelfth Cake. It goes way, way, way back. You can see it uh, in the illustrations and read it in the text. Right. So let's get started. The very first thing we want to work on are the, the is getting the pan ready, or in this case, our cake form. Right. We're using hoops. Um, uh, you find references to these in the cookbooks. They're called garths. Uh, we have a tin hoop. Right. Uh, our our uh, coppersmith actually makes these. Peter Goebel. It's a reproduction, 18th mm -hmm. century reproduction. Uh, this, though, our wooden hoop, we've kind of cheated, hoop. haven't yeah. we? Right. This hoop actually comes from our uh, our sieves, that our brand new sieves that we're carrying. You can disassemble this sieve. You may not be able to reassemble it again. Nope. Uh, but it, it makes a perfect, it's exactly the same size as our tin one. And they talk about using wood ones instead of tin ones that they actually might work better. They don't, they won't burn the cake. Right. Because right. they don't transmit that heat in quite the same way. They sort of insulate it. The, these cakes are very dense and they're very heavy. In fact, the recipe that we're using, we're cutting it into fourths and it's gonna produce a five pound cake. So just imagine a 20 pound cake, yeah. a much, it would take a much larger hoop than this. Yeah. And, and the wood actually shields the outside of the cake to keep it from burning. Those larger cakes, they would often put even like a, a paste or a, pa a pastry paste in the bottom to, uh, and let it absorb the, the majority of the heat so that the cake itself isn't burned. I, I've got two circles of parchment paper. And uh, you would really want to start off uh, by covering uh, the, it's going to be the bottom of your garth or hoop. Um, and you would lay this on top and then just go around and crinkle it down to get it to fit. And uh, once you have it down, kind of formed around it, uh, we need to tie it on. If you're having trouble getting this string good and tight on there, you can add a little wedge. That'll get it nice and tight without you having to fuss with the knot. All right, so now that we have the paper on the bottom, we're gonna butter this up. Uh, it's important that you butter it up. It just, the, the cake won't yeah. stick to it. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna go on ahead and uh, just slime this all around, try and fill in, especially that crack along the edge. We need to line the side of this as well. So I've got a long strip here um, that's cut long enough to go all the way around. And it helps, you know, to butter the, the lay it out flat on the table, butter the paper first and then put it in uh, so that the butter is on the inside, not on the outside. And that kind of helps the paper to stick together there at the where it overlaps. And that way it won't keep collapsing. This is ready to go. And now we can start on the main preparation. Right, right. The recipes can be very specific. They actually call for making sure to have all your ingredients ahead of time so that you've got them all set out before you start mixing it. So this recipe calls for a full pound of butter as well as uh, uh, about a half pound of sugar. We have eight eggs and we've separated the yolks from the whites. After that, we have three cups or about a pound of flour, along with three quarters of a teaspoon of ground mace and ground nutmeg. Then we have a half a cup or a gill of brandy, a quarter cup each of candied orange, lemon, and citron rind, one cup of slivered almonds, and a pound of Zante currants. But for Twelfth Night, there's one more ingredient, right? Uh, yeah, we can't forget the coin or the bean. If you're going to use a coin, make sure it's not copper. Silver would be best. Let's start off with the very easiest mixing here because it's gonna get much tougher later on. I'm gonna mix the currants, and these are Zante currants. They're basically miniature raisins. Uh, we're gonna mix the currants along with all these sweet meats that we've picked out. Uh, also, in goes the uh, the slivered almonds or the uh, sliced almonds here. Well, while John's doing that, I got the easier of the two jobs. I'm gonna take the flour, three cups, and the uh, nutmeg and the mace. And we're gonna mix that up. And we're gonna, when we get both of these mixed up separately, we're gonna set them aside. 
and then the fun begins. You need to whip the whites and, and the, the yolks. yolks. And separately. 30 minutes if you're doing it by minute. hand. Okay. I'll catch up with you later. I'm gonna take this pound of butter. Now this butter is semi-soft, all right? But I need to cream it. Now, in a modern kitchen, you would cream butter by sticking it in a um, mixer, but they didn't have mixers in the 18th century. So you had to do it by hand. And the warmth of your hand will soften the butter. And as you squeeze it and work it, you're gonna start working air into it. Until finally, it's going to look like a yellow whipped cream. When this butter is softened up, we can go on ahead and add our half a pound of sugar. And I'll continue beating this up until this is uh, really nice and smooth and fluffy. And I'm gonna keep working on these eggs until we've got them to a nice uh, stiff peak stage. Okay, John, now that we've faded through black, literally and figuratively, uh, we have to take these three components and uh, fold them into whichever bowl is the biggest. I think this one's the biggest. We offer these uh, birchwood wooden whisks on our website. They're handmade and uh, professional chefs uh, prefer uh, whisks like this even today uh, for certain purposes. Uh, one of the interesting things about this piece is that it is an egg leavened uh, cake. And egg leavening is one of the leavening types that you see in uh, 18th century cooking. You don't see what we would use in a cake today, which is, uh, of course, chemical leavening. So this is the kind of cake that they would have made. And now we're gonna fold in this, um, this flour a little bit at a time. And we really have to keep moving. We're losing the air bubbles even as we speak. Here we go, we have this beautiful, light, and airy batter. It, it's amazing, it has such a wonderful texture to it. And now in go the sweet meats, or in this case, this we're gonna fold this into the sweet meats. Right, right. You're gonna need a big bowl for this. Okay, that is such a real, it, it's a light, airy batter. And we need to be careful about stirring that too hard or we'll beat that air out right. of there. Um, our hoop is ready, that's ready. We need to uh, marry the two, so, so to speak. Now, the recipe says to put this immediately in the oven. We're gonna put this in at 350 degrees for about two hours. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it, it looks wonderful. It's even risen over the top. So yeah. you didn't sh shape this, it came up over the top. And if you see those period illustrations, you'll see that very thing happening, that the cake is sort of mounded up in the center. Right. There we go. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. Paper, Just paper came right came, off. Came right off. Oh my goodness. It looks perfect. <laughs> I, I say let's let's slice into this and see what see what it's really like. All right, let's do it. Well, it looks perfect on the inside. It's wow. got a great coloration. Hmm. Oh wow. wow. It tastes so lemon. Excellent. Yeah. All the, everything's coming through wonderfully. And the almonds. Oh, all that. that fruit in there. Wow. This recipe is so wonderful. It's full of flavors. Mm. Uh, it's, it's great, and I hope you get a chance to try it. It makes a wonderful holiday uh, cake, and I hope everyone out there has a wonderful, happy 12th night. So sauerkraut's usually not my, say, favorite thing. It's a little too... What can I say? It's a little too sour, but I like it when it's paired with other things, when it's maybe an ingredient in another dish. And, well, some people probably wouldn't argue with me that sauerkraut is an acquired taste. When the 18th century Scottish physician James Lind performed clinical trials looking for the prevention and the cure of uh, scurvy, he, he found that acidic foods like citrus and sauerkraut were excellent remedies. Scurvy is a horrible and painful disease that left untreated meant certain death. It's estimated that during the age of sail, more than two million sailors died from that disease. That's more than, the, than died from 
injuries, other diseases, and war casualties combined. In addition, General George Washington, in a requisition to Congress in 1777, requested large amounts of sauerkraut. So when Lind published his findings in 1753, it had revolutionary effects on the lives of sailors and soldiers as well. Like I said earlier, uh, sauerkraut can be an acquired taste, and it certainly was in the 18th century. The, uh, the famous explorer Captain Cook had sauerkraut along on his journey, but the, the sailors weren't uh, very happy with it. To, so to qualm their complaints, he actually ate the sauerkraut in their presence to encourage their eating of it and it actually had an immediate effect. Sauerkraut is assumed by many to be primarily a German dish, but many other uh, countries or uh, cultures had it too. The Dutch, uh, the French had their version, the Italians, the Russians, and many more. Some believed it originated in northern climates where early frosts might destroy the cabbage crop, and so farmers needed a way to preserve their cabbages for the long term or over the winter. What turns cabbage into sauerkraut is the fermentation process. Uh, there were a few 18th century recipes for sauerkraut that actually suggested uh, the introduction of yeast into the sauerkraut barrel. Most recipes, however, uh, anticipated the spontaneous fermentation uh, going on inside the, the dish. And, and now, of course, we know that that fermentation is caused by the lactobacillus. They didn't at the time. The same kind of fermentation that you would find in cheeses and in yogurt. So there's really no need to put yeast in your sauerkraut. The basic manufacture of sauerkraut is very simple. There's just two ingredients. You need cabbage and you need salt. I recommend uh, one or two tablespoons of salt per pound of cabbage. To get started, we need to select a quality cabbage. You'll need to uh, remove the outer uh, damaged leaves. Once that you've got those leaves off, you can slice your cabbage in half and then take out the heart. So you need to slice up your cabbage into the slivers. You can either use a nice big knife. That can be difficult. Uh, you can use a food processor at home, or you can use a mandolin or slaw cutter like this one. We picked this one up very recently at a garage sale. Um, this one's, you know, probably from early 20th century, but remarkably, the, the design is very similar. It's been used, similar ones have been used for hundreds of years. The fermentation process is very simple, and you, you really, you start out with a container, and you can use, uh, say, like a barrel, like they would have used in the 18th century. Uh, they also used crocks, which were very popular. Here's, a, here's an older uh, ceramic crock. Uh, we're going to be using a smaller, just one of our storage jars. We don't make a, a whole lot. It really depends. The container depends on how much you want to make. You at home, you could even make this in a mason jar. It's very simple. So there is one caveat, however, if you want to use an old crock, an antique crock, uh, unless it's salt glaze, and even then, if it's salt glaze on the outside, it's likely that it might be lead glaze on the inside, and uh, sauerkraut is acidic and so that it, it might draw the lead out of that glaze. So I actually don't suggest using an antique crock for making your sauerkraut. Modern ones would likely have the proper kind of glaze, so that would be all right. We're gonna sprinkle a little bit of salt down in the bottom of this. Uh, make sure to use uh, kosher salt or um, pickling salt, even better. Definitely not iodized salt. Now we can begin to layer in our cabbage, and we're gonna put a little bit of cabbage in, but as we put the cabbage in, it needs to be smashed down. Now we can use uh, anything. Here's a, uh, one of our rolling pins. This is perfect for this job, or uh, if you've got one of our wooden mashers, another product that's great for smashing this cabbage down and getting those juices flowing. I'll make sure to put a link down to all these products down in the description below. As each layer goes in, we're going to put, we're going to smash it down, and then we're going to add a little layer of salt, and then we go ahead and put in another layer of cabbage. Now that we've got our container about three quarters of the way full, we can stop putting this in. We, we do want to make sure it's all smashed down nice and tight in our container, and we're actually going to wait a day or two, maybe three days, 
to see where the liquid comes up because liquid's going to come out of your cabbage and it depends on your cabbage as to how much is really going to and how much you smash it down how much liquid's going to come out of that you may have sufficient liquid in your cabbage to get uh, water all the way up over the top of your your uh, your shredded cabbage uh, if you need to add more liquid at the three day mark if if uh, you don't have a solution over the top of your shredded cabbage you'll need to add a brine solution um, so the brine solution should be something about a teaspoon of salt in a cup of water you want to dissolve that salt and then you can add that solution in on top of your shredded cabbage to make sure that it's always underneath the liquid also at this point uh, your cabbage need to, needs to be weighed down. So you need to have a rock, um, a board with a rock on top of it. If you're worried about your rock contaminating your, your water, you can put it inside of a plastic bag, uh, even a plastic bag full of water. But you want something on top of this cabbage weighing it down so that it stays underneath the water and doesn't float to the top. Once you've covered your cabbage and you've got the weight on top of it, all you need to do is put the lid on and uh, let it set. As we're letting this uh, ferment, we need to make sure to wait the proper amount of time. Bare minimum, this is going to take two to three weeks. It really depends on the temperature and some other factors. Uh, six weeks is more normal or even longer. A couple of months, no problem. It's only going to get better. And while it's fermenting, you'll need to check on it every once in a while to make sure that the, the liquid level hasn't fallen down below the level of the top of your sauerkraut. So make sure the sauerkraut is always covered with water. If you ever find mold growing on the top of your sauerkraut, you know what you all, all you really need to do is scrape that moldy part off. Make sure you get it all, resubmerge your sauerkraut and let it keep percolating. It will be fine. Sauerkraut was a preferred sailor and soldier food uh, because no one had to worry about it spoiling. I mean, it's already spoiled, right? That's what makes it good. Now we're going to let this ferment, but say you really love sauerkraut and you can't wait for this to ferment six weeks or whatever. You, you really want it right away. Well, in an upcoming episode, we're going to be doing another style of sauerkraut that one naval officer of the time period would called Tuscan style sauerkraut. And that one is pickled with vinegar. Uh, if you haven't tried out this kind of sauerkraut, and say maybe you're not a big fan. I'm not a big fan of sauerkraut. I'm not either. Jo Josh isn't a big fan of sauerkraut either, at least until we tried this homemade this sauerkraut. This is good. I'll eat this stuff. I mean, it's okay. Right. It's much better than anything you're going to buy at the store. So even if you're not currently a fan of sauerkraut, go ahead and give this a try. I know you will like it better. Let's get started on this sauerkraut soup. This is such an easy recipe. We're going to start off here with a little bit of uh, a soup base, uh, beef broth, or what we've used here is portable soup in our recipe. Uh, if you're interested in portable soup, I'll put a link to portable soup episodes that we've done in the past. Uh, also, if you've boiled your beef, uh, perfect. You can use that uh, boiled beef as uh, boiled beef water as your base for your soup. So there are only a few ingredients in this soup. Uh, we've got our beef broth and uh, we've got onions. Actually, I'm using today pickled onions. Uh, pickled onions were very popular in the 18th century and they may have been used by the military, but most likely officers. This would have been an expensive kind of thing. Today we're using pickled onions. You can use regular onions, just raw onions. Um, cut them up and put them into your broth and let them simmer for a while. I can just toss these straight in. And the last ingredient that goes into our soup is the sauerkraut itself. And we're gonna let this simmer for just a little bit. There's a lot of documentation for sauerkraut for sailors and soldiers in the 18th century. And the reason for this is has to do with scurvy. Scurvy was a, a big killer of soldiers and sailors. Uh, during the age of sail, more sailors died from scurvy than died from all other causes. Disease, war, uh, all those things combined, scurvy was a bigger killer. That leads us to James Lind. James Lind was a physician in the 18th century and he discovered a cure for scurvy. Here's a little piece out of his uh, treatise on the prevention of the scurvy. It's uh, 1753. 
He says, every common sailor ought to lay in a stock of onions. I never observed any that used them fall into the scurvy at sea. When this stock is exhausted, the captains may have recourse to their pickled small onions and with fowls, muttons, or portable soup, and the pickled cabbage before mentioned, of which the Dutch fell great quantities. Uh, they will be able to make a broth at sea almost the same as that is used in our naval hospitals for the recovery of ascorbic people. Here we go. Uh, the soup should be ready. Basically, as soon as I put that sauerkraut in, you can serve it up. If you want to let it warm up, that's okay too. Let's go ahead and give this a try. Got a nice beefy flavor. The onions are great. Strong. It's not quite as bitter um, as no. you might expect it because, you know, sometimes sauerkraut really comes in with a lot of sourness, but it's kind of balanced out by the amount of liquid that was really in the in there with the uh, the beef broth. There's really no need for salt in this because the, the crowd already had plenty of salt in it. So it, it it's really a good flavor right right off the bat. Right. Maybe some pepper, but mm -hmm. hey, that's that's a soldier talking. Oh uh, yeah. A little bit of sauce is what we want. I, I'd want to liberate some vegetables from a garden and mm. really kick this over the top. If you've got beef boiling, that would be a great thing to add to this. It would be a wonderful addition. You know, fried ham or um, sausage. Mm -hmm. And um, salt pork? I salt think. pork. Any of those would be great additions also. Um, and in a sailor context, lobscouse. This would go great in a lobscouse if you're interested in that. I've got an episode on that and I'll put a link down in the description section. Because this is so correct, I really want you to try it. But you know, some people still don't like sauerkraut that much. But there's a trick. There's a, there's a trick that might help you out with oh. that. And it's, it's actually referred to in several 18th century cookbooks, and that is rinsing your sauerkraut off. You can rinse oh. it off maybe once, up to three times to get rid of that mm, sourness that would do it. and that saltiness. So that would be something to try. If this still isn't quite your thing, give it a rinse, see how that works out. Today's recipe comes from a cookbook that we have not used before. It's called The Modern Method of Cookery Improved, written in 1767 by Anne Shackelford. This recipe is for pickled cabbage. I know, I know, it's not traditional sauerkraut that depends on fermentation for its flavor, but instead, this one uses vinegar. Now, we found one reference to this type of sauerkraut, uh, as you would call it, in a naval chronicle from 1789, and he referred to this uh, style of sauerkraut as that made in Tuscan. Shackelford's recipe suggests cubing your cabbage, but we're going to be following other similar recipes and slicing your cabbage as you would for a normal uh, sauerkraut. The recipe calls for using red cabbage. That's what's going to give it this wonderful color when we're done. There, that should be more than enough. Uh, today we're using just one of our small storage jars, so we don't need a whole lot. Uh, you can also do this in a mason jar just as easily. Now it's time to pack our shredded cabbage in tightly into our container. One recipe we ran into actually had uh, uh, the directions of putting onion slices a little in between each one of the layers. Our final step is to make our pickle. And uh, for this we're going to need a vinegar. Uh, you can use uh, just about any kind of vinegar, a, uh, a white vinegar, uh, apple cider vinegar, but most traditionally, for the right traditional flavor, I would suggest you use malt vinegar. To our boiling vinegar, we're going to add about a teaspoon and a half of whole peppercorns, about the same amount of thinly sliced fresh ginger, and about half that amount of whole allspice. Now it's time to pour our boiling hot uh, vinegar uh, pickle on top of our uh, cabbage. We want to make sure it covers it completely and when that's done we just cover this up lightly and now it's time to let this set. You uh, probably should keep this in your refrigerator uh, two or three days minimum 
It's going to be much better after a week or, a, or even two. Okay, so here is some we made earlier. And uh, many times uh, they would serve this with other things like beef or they might add other pickles in it like we've done here to make a colorful garnish for your table. So let's give this one a try. Hmm. Very good. It's a great pickly kind of flavor. It's wonderful. The color is amazing. And the flavor, well, it's got a lot of flavor. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing dish. If you like uh, pickly kind of things, you really need to try to make some of your very own pickled cabbage. Hi, I'm John Townsend, and with me today is Michael Dragoo, and we're making... Oxford Kate's Sausages. This is from the Martha Washington cookbook, and Oxford Kate, she thinks, should have been Oxford Gate. Um, Oxford, the town, had a surrounding walls and a gate, and there was a tavern at the North Gate. Okay, Oxford so Gate. it's famous for Oxford that Oxford Gate Sausage, yes. Okay, so it looks pretty simple. Oh, um, yeah. What do we got here for ingredients? We are going to um, mince. She calls for ham or veal. I decided I could use ham and veal. I have a pound of veal, I have a pound of ham, and a half a pound of suet. If you're looking for suet, it can be very difficult to find. Uh, on our website and in our print catalog, we have this wonderful uh, suet that is available. It's called tallow here, but it's what they would have called suet in the 18th century. It's rendered kidney fat, not muscle fat. I'm gonna be um, introducing the two meats and the suet together, mix okay. that all up. I'm gonna add one egg yolk as a binder. Right. And then I've got salt, pepper, mace, sage, and cloves. I'm just gonna mix that in. Um, this, this recipe originally called for an entire leg of ham, uh, of pig, and, and a, it was 12 pounds of meat uh, put together, so we've really uh, reduced these quantities, but they are to taste. Now that we've got this uh, thoroughly mixed, it, mm -hmm. the, the recipe is simple. It just says to, to roll these out to the thickness of a finger. So um, these are gonna be about the size of a breakfast sausage. And they, they smell good right there, just with oh, the spices yeah. and everything. These are wonderful. They, they look great. It's surprising how light these sausages wind up being. Right. But that, you would think, oh, they're going to be heavy yep. and, no. you know, but the, the fat actually does something completely different than what you would expect. Yep. Yeah, and these, in, in different circumstances, you might just call these force meat sausages. Yep. yep. Force, Same thing. Yeah, force meat is, is taking the meat and making it be something other than what it looks when it's just a cut of meat. Right. Okay, I've got the pan good and hot, and uh, I've got a little bit of, well, a good little bit of suet already in the pan. You could use butter to cook these in, but the suet's not gonna burn and smoke the same way butter would. So I recommend either um, a rendered uh, butter, like a ghee, or this suet. I'm gonna be very gentle with these so that they don't fall apart, because they're not like your modern breakfast sausage. All okay, right. the, the sausages are done, yep. and the recipe actually calls for these to have a little mustard sauce. So didn't, didn't say what the mustard sauce consisted of. So uh, simple mustard uh, sauces are just butter and mustard seed. Um, I've right. added vinegar, some white wine, sugar, a little salt. That's what my sauce is. Well, it looks great. I guess let's give these a try. Yeah, I'm ready. Are you? Yes. Oh. Hmm. Look at that. I'm about to double dip. Oh man, those are excellent. You would compare these with a modern day breakfast sausage, right? But they are not the same. These are mm. much lighter of, of a texture, yep. much, not nearly as firm. Not kind as of, dense, no. Right, uh, and uh, mustard sauce, something I would not have expected. No. Not, not something I would naturally put on something no. like this. It's like, but, a, it's like a heavy stone ground mustard. It's got that kind of taste to it. Mm. These things, the suet just, melts away, melts right out of it, so that you have these great little voids, and it's a right. light, it's a light sausage. It's got some wonderful spicy flavors in there, yeah. uh, and the nice quantity of saltiness. I would have told you I hated cloves, but I it really adds something to this. It's really mm. low-key. Mm -hmm. This one is great. It's uh, definitely, it's easy, it's simple. You should be able to do this yep. in nothing flat, yep. and it makes a wonderful little sausage, so make sure to give this one a try. So today's recipe is from uh, William Robichaud's The Whole Body of Cookery Dissected. Let me read this one for you. This, one's, uh, this recipe book is from 1682. It says, how to make small pendants to fry for the first course. 
Take one pint of flour, as much grated bread, eight eggs, cast away the whites, or five thereof. Beat it to a thick batter with cream, rose water, sack. Season it with beaten cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg, and mace. Put it, uh, let's see, put to it a handful of parboiled currants and a handful of minced marrow. If not beef suet, add salt, then let your pan be hot with clarified butter or sweet suet. Let it drop in by spoonfuls. When they are fried on both sides, dish them up on the table or plate and scrape on sugar. You may add a handful of sugar to the batter. It's an interesting recipe. It's what we encounter all the time. Yeah, you get recipes like this that are just, they're very vague. Yes. And you wonder just what this relates to in a current um, recipe, a pendant. We looked up pendant, I couldn't find couldn't anything. Find it. Nope. There was no word. It could be a misspelling of pendant. It, it's a or, slang for something. I've read all of the different descriptions for pendant and nothing was nothing, involved in cooking, right. no. Right, so, so we don't know what that, we're gonna not worry about the name then. No. Um, this seems like um, maybe a, a sort of a fritter, maybe, in that it's kind of deep fat fried, kind of. When you sent it to me and I was reading through it, it was a cookie until, they wouldn't have called it that then, but right. up until we we're boiling it in oil pretty much, so. Right, so this is an odd one. So we're just gonna try this yep. guy out and do our very best and see what it turns out like. Uh, so I've I've got our ingredients here, almost everything. It says it starts out with one pint of flour. Okay. And we're just gonna use all-purpose flour. And we're gonna half this recipe, so yes. everything you hear there, um, we're gonna cut it in half, or else we'll have 500 pendants. Um, uh, as much grated bread. So we've got breadcrumbs yep. here. Um, Again, basically one cup. Yep. Uh, now it says eight eggs, cast away the whites. Beat them up and pour those in. What we're trying to achieve here is a thick batter. So the rest of the liquid ingredients, we're just gonna kind of guess as we go. There's no exact measurements. Right. Um, we need cream is next. Okay. This is a Joe cup of cream. Yep. Hopefully it's about right. If we need more, we'll add more. Um, and rose water. I don't have rose water with me. I do have orange flower water. Okay. There you go. Um, that's yeah. just a little bit. I don't think we need a lot. Okay. That just gives it a, a fragrance. We need some sack, or we okay. just have regular white wine here. Yep. Two or three tablespoons. Yeah. We're gonna try that much. Nice. So it still looks pretty thick here. We're yeah. only just, oh, it's way too thick. So too thick. let's keep adding um, more cream to this. Okay. This is really oh, an experiment. We, we just have no idea where this is gonna go. So I don't know, where are we at with uh, cream? We've got about a pint in here. <laughs> <laughs> about a gallon and a half of heavy whipping cream. My arteries are gonna stop, just clock right up. So now it seems more like a thick batter. <laughs> yeah. Took a lot of cream to get there. It took about 20 minutes worth of cream. <laughs> Sneaking up uh, on this. Let's add the uh, the next ingredients. We want uh, cinnamon. We're just gonna kind of guess it here. That's uh, a teaspoon and a half maybe. Yep. Ginger, about yep. the same amount. Um, this is just regular powdered ginger. It's gonna be good. Nutmeg and mace. You've got some mace over yep, there. Yep, got mace right here. There's some already ground up in Perfect. there. Perfect. Every recipe's gotta have nutmeg. Why even bother to cook it if you don't have nutmeg? This is like a snickerdoodle recipe I did a couple of years ago. Uh-oh. Same ingredients. I don't wanna hear about that. Deep fried snickerdoodles. This is gonna be great. <laughs> I haven't tried that. Yet. I like deep fried anything. A handful of parboiled currants. And what we've got here are Zante currants. Okay. And I went ahead and, and kind of simmered these ahead of time. Yep. Go ahead and take a handful sure. of those. And add a handful of minced marrow, which is not easy to get a hold of these days necessarily, um, or or suet, or beef suet that's yep. chopped up. So two or three tablespoons three. of suet. Again, it doesn't call for a, a measurement, so this is gonna be kind of totally crazy and a little bit of salt. At the very end, it says you may add a handful of sugar to the batter. Yep. Um, it's, it also says to put sugar on top when you're done. So I think we're gonna wait for the sugar at the end. We'll not put any in the batter. I would do both. You would do, you would do. Well, they're gonna burn a little more easily if we put the sugar in the batter. So let's not do that. Yeah. So this is gonna take a little bit of interpretation here. Yep. Uh, after we have our, our batter mixed up, it says then let your pan be hot with clarified butter or sweet suet. Okay, what's sweet suet? Um, I, what she probably means there is fresh rendered fresh, suet. Okay. So we're gonna take suet and uh, get our pan filled up. And it's hard to tell whether she means to deep, or he, I'm sorry, whether he means to deep fat fry these. I think it's just sort of halfway. Okay. We're just gonna get a nice uh, thick layer right. of suet going in the pan. So our pan is good and hot. Let's bring the, uh, 
bring the pieces in here and go ahead and plop in yeah, we'll a spoonful. A Hopefully it's not too hot. Not sure how much to put in. Well, it says spoonful, yeah. so. Here we go. Yeah, the question is, are these pancakes or are they fritters? Yes. I don't know. And they are kind of a little bit like halfway between, as far as yeah. I can tell. I don't know. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and I'm going to take some of these out because right. they look like they're... I'll just let them drain on the... Yeah, we'll let yeah. them drain on cloth here. Well, here's our experiment. They look very interesting, a little different. Okay. Um, let's give them a try. You first. I like it. I haven't decided that yet whether it's um, a pancake or it's a fritter. It's um, not as heavy as I thought, as I thought no, they were going to be. No, it's a little lighter. I like the currants a lot. I don't taste the wine at all. No, no, it's not whiny. And you could have used uh, grape juice instead of the wine. Uh, uh, it doesn't really matter. That's one of those recipes that you just don't know how it's going to turn out. It's so odd. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Huh. Well, you can see what it's like. We dip into a cookbook, you never know quite what you're gonna right. find. Very, very interesting. 17th century pendants. Pendants. I don't even know what that is. Nope. But now we do. So, Michael, tell us a little bit about this recipe. Sure, I found this in a um, Martha Washington's Book of Cookery. Okay. Uh, her first husband was Daniel Custis, and um, that family inherited a cookbook um, right. through marriage, mm -hmm. and it fell down through the generations. These recipes are coming from the 1670s, 1680s. So these and are then, trout fillets? These are just trout fillets I bought it at, uh, at the uh, store. We're gonna take the skin off. Alrighty. Okay, so these look beautiful. They've got their skin off of them. Yep. Now, what do we do next with them? I'm just gonna cut them into chunks. Okay. In preparation for uh, putting them in the uh, right in the uh, liquid. So, how big a chunks are we doing? I'm going just gonna do here. about an inch square. All right, we're gonna start making the sippets. If you could uh, right take care of that, I'll get the sauce going. Okay. Yeah, sippets in this. Uh, circumstance are the, uh, it's a, another term for sops yeah. or a little toasted thing that you would put in a soup. Uh, in this case, I'm going to cut these up and I'll cook these in a pan, yeah. make them into giant croutons. It's almost say. like a toast point today. Mm -hmm. Just something to sop up the leftovers. This is a simple sauce. All we did was um, melt some butter. The recipe is very inconcise. It's however much you want. So it's uh, some butter and some white wine. I used a sweet wine, a cheap sweet wine. It's salt to taste, it's ginger to taste, and a couple of sprigs of rosemary. So if you were uh, producing uh, more material, you'd have more of each of those ingredients. This is a full immersion or a partial immersion, doesn't matter. If you've only got enough uh, sauce to cover half the trout, then you're gonna spoon some, some sauce over the trout uh, to poach it. Um, we have enough depth here that I'm gonna fully immerse the, the trout into this. Alrighty, I think we're up to boiling. I'm going to take it off the fire and introduce the trout. While he's getting the uh, trout cooked over there, I'm going to get these little sippets uh, toasting up in our pan. I'm going to introduce the fish in here. I don't want the trout to be boiled in the uh, sauce because I don't want the trout to fall apart. This is just gonna be lightly poaching it. We need to poach this for about three to five minutes. Okay, here are our sippets. Oh, there we go. And Let's plop uh, a couple in there. Okay. And I'm gonna spoon some... Uh, there we are. Some trout on there. You know, it smells great. That rosemary is something a little different. I'm it not used to yeah. in uh, in cooking, but well, it looks beautiful. I wouldn't have put ginger with trout either. So. Yeah, yeah. So let's uh, try this. I'm going to try a whole sip it with. Yep. Same thing. Whoa, that is great. That's mm. The the fish was just so lightly cooked. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But it's perfectly cooked all the way through, and all it took was that heat that was just residual in the pan yep. and in the cooking sauce. No, it's wonderful. And it did not take very long at all. You were just done just like that. And oh. the flavors are amazing. Well, I've got the recipe right here. Uh, I'll just tell you how easy it is. To boil a trout, cut each trout in pieces, then boil it in white wine, some butter, as much salt as will season it, a little rosemary, some grated or sliced ginger. When it's boiled, serve it up with sops or sippets laid in the bottom of each sides of each dish. That's it. We're all guessing it. 
how much fish, how much of any of these right. materials, and that's all to taste. And we tried it the first time, and, and it's really good. I don't know right. what I'd do differently. Is, yes. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't do a thing differently. It doesn't need any more spices. It doesn't need any more cooking. It's perfect. Right. So it's been a long time since we've done any meat uh, recipes, and I thought this one was it's quite interesting. No, I'm excited about this. Um, it's only got just a few ingredients. It's got flour, it's got suet, a little bit of water. We're going to make that into a thick paste. Right. Then we're going to put in to that paste um, the meat that we've cut up fairly finely, right? Right. And this is two pounds of round uh, steak. I'll slice this into thin slices, and you can season it. And season that with salt and pepper, and it's ready to go. So let's get started on our paste, and this is just as simple as it could possibly get. We've got uh, flour here, right? How much? About three uh, cups of flour, three and cups. this is this is a fine, just unbleached flour. Yeah, right. right. And I've got about fourteen ounces of suet. Now, if if you don't know what suet is, or even if you think you know what suet is, I would suggest you watch our video on suet. So we just need these two things, the 14 ounces of suet, the three cups of flour, and a little bit of cold water. This is gonna make a, a pretty stiff paste. So before you get started with this, uh, the very first thing you wanna do is get a couple of large pots of water boiling while you're doing the prep work. So I'm going to lay out the cloth here, and now we can we can uh, go ahead and, and flour that so that the, our pudding doesn't stick. We've got a bowl here right. to help shape it, right? And now we can get that uh, our pre-rolled out paste into our cloth, and that makes a nice little I don't know a little dough bowl here to mm -hmm. to put this in. Okay, so now it's time for the beef, right? Right. We're going to make a ball of meat in the center of it. All right, so that that was quick, but I have a feeling there's a flip side to this recipe. The the flip side is that this takes forever to boil. How much did we use in this we one? We have about two pounds. Two pounds. Uh, this one should take three hours to boil at least. And if it's bigger than this, it might take five or six hours, depending on how much meat you've got in this. The bigger the ball is, the harder it is to get to that. That temperature to get to the center. And that's why you have the two pots boiling, right? Right. You want to have the, you always want to have the pot full. And when it starts to boil down too far, you need to add more water. And you don't want to add cold water because right. that'll bring the temperature down. So you want to add hot water to it. So you want to have two pots ready to go. One always to be cooking and the other one to be refilling the pot if you need to refill it. Okay. Well, how about if we go on ahead and so we just close this up? So we got this all together. I'll let you go ahead and tie it. Yeah, and some, get some string in there. Some puddings you tie loosely, uh, some puddings you tie tightly. This one is one that you want to tie tightly. Now, I just tied a loop on there because we may need that loop to hang this to let it cool just a little bit when right. it's done. So, right. all right, I think that's ready to go. Our water's okay. boiling. Let's get this into the water. Okay. Now, again, you want to make sure that your water is boiling before you put your pudding in and make sure you have that standby water ready if the water gets too low in your pot. When it's time, you've, you've got your three hours or longer in and you think this is done, it's now time to take it out. You can let it drain for a moment or two so that there's not too much water there uh, around the pudding. And then you can dunk that in cold water to cool that off and that'll help release the cloth. There we are. There, we have a little bit of uh, right, right. peel away, but, but look at that crust though, that, look right. at that pastry. Wow. So, I guess we're gonna break in and see what it's like, huh? I can't wait. Okay. Oh, John, you know what we need for this? Mushroom ketchup. There you go. Okay, I you need first. a little bit of mushroom ketchup. It looks like it's completely done. Um, yeah. It's completely cooked all the way to the center, so we don't have to worry about that. The paste is set up, of course, perfectly, and this audit, it, it kind of reminds me of those meat pies, those, uh, those pasties. You know, yeah, pasties. 
So let's give these guys a try. And of course we get... Wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. A wonderful mix. Mm-hmm. Between the paste, and the meat is cooked perfectly, and that holds the juices in, too. Mm -hmm. Instead of just, like, boiling the meat, which was another choice in the time period, which would have boiled away a lot of the flavor. In fact, that's one of the reasons why they would put a boiled pudding in with their boiling meat, so that that pudding would absorb some of that flavor. Mm. So here, we've got that, that meat flavor has gone into the paste, and it's cooked it and kept the juices in. Right. That's just like roast beef. I mean, right. It, wow, that is fabulous. This has got my vote, John. I think this is in the in the top tier of it, recipes that we've done. It certainly is excellent. And it's one of the it's an easy way to cook this meat with very little equipment. You can really uh, you know, that same kind of boiling thing. All you need is a pot, basically to cook this in, so mm -hmm. it turns out mm -hmm. wonderful. So this recipe comes from uh, a cookbook called Professed Cookery. It's the 1755 edition, it's the second edition, it's by Ann Cook. It's a very interesting cookbook. Uh, Ann Cook really takes to task can of glass in this cookbook. She takes 78 pages to uh, complain about Hannah Glass's cookbook, the fact that she steals her recipes, and that she isn't a very good cook in general. So there's a lot of, of that in the cookbook, but there's a lot of very interesting recipes also. And this recipe uh, I thought was kind of fun because, you know, we're used to pigs in a blanket. Um, we might think that that's a very modern concept, even the name, but here we have in this recipe, um, lamb in a blanket, and it's, it's somewhat similar. Let's get started. Before you do anything, make sure you have a large pot of water on to boil. The recipe calls for a lamb loin. Now the loin cut uh, many times gets cut into chops, lamb chops, uh, so it might be difficult to find a lamb loin. You can use leg of lamb also. Um, if you have difficulty finding that or you want to try a different kind of meat, you could do this with beef, you could do this with uh, pork, like a pork loin also. We're using leg of lamb here. The recipe calls for callops. We've cut this into one half inch thick steaks. And now as the recipe says, we're gonna pound these out into thin callops. We've prepared eight callops for this recipe. I've set the callops aside and now it's time to work on the paste, the blanket for this lamb. This uh, paste is pretty simple. Uh, I'm going to start off here with six cups of flour. This is all-purpose flour, but you could use a pastry flour also. Um, I'm going to add a dash of salt into this that will mix in. Um, it's not necessarily in the recipe, but this is just a really just a simple paste. Also, six ounces of butter, and this is chopped up, and we will cut this in. Next, we'll whisk together two eggs along with a gill of cold water. That's a half a cup. This is a pretty stiff paste. You might need to add a little bit more cold water to get it to really hang together. You'll need this to get it into shape. And if this is fighting you, you can pound it with the rolling pin and that, that helps it kind of relax and go together. Let's cut this into, into a half and then into eight equal pieces. Now it's time to construct our lambs in a blanket. This construction is pretty simple. Let's take one of our sheets of paste, take one of our callops, and dip it in egg yolk, and place it at one edge. Now with a little bit of seasoning, we'll put in a pinch of salt on top and a pinch of nutmeg, the thing that seems to be the seasoning in every one of these 18th century recipes. Uh, on top of this goes force meat. The recipe actually calls for a force meat made of lamb suet and kidneys. Kidneys can be very 
in a lamb kidney is very difficult to get a hold of unless you've got a specialty butcher. So in this case, we're going to be using a force meat of, this is pork and, and uh, beef, which sometimes is sold in the supermarket as a meatloaf mix. Or you could just use any kind of raw sausage type mix that you like. We're gonna spread this out nice and thin on top of our callop. Now let's roll the meat up. Let's take it back to the edge and now let's roll this up and fold the ends. This paste is a little delicate, so have to be careful with it. And we'll set that aside and work on the next one. She calls for these to be boiled. In other places in this cookbook, uh, these, she referenced the idea that, that you could bake these, but boiling them is, the, is more efficient because you don't have to uh, heat up your oven. So we've got uh, small pieces of cloth cut out here. We're using a natural cloth. This is uh, just an Osnaburg cloth, but uh, linen or just a plain muslin will work for this also. And we're gonna roll these up the same way we rolled up the paste. And now we just tie off the ends so that they end up looking like little sausages. Before you place these in the water, make sure it's boiling and they'll need to boil for approximately an hour. While these are boiling, you can prepare a sauce. This particular sauce is a cup or two of your favorite broth. Bring that to a boil. You can take it off the boil and start adding a tablespoon or two of butter, a little bit at a time. Then you can season it with a little bit of salt and pepper. And Cook recommends to uh, send these to the table with a little bit of gravy poured on top. She doesn't mention exactly what that should look like. I've taken the first one here and sliced it over the top, opened it up a little bit and poured on the gravy. Or you could slice them up in medallions and pour the gravy over the top of that. Well, it's a moment of truth. Let's find out what this uh, beautiful little dish tastes like. Mmm, it's great. You know, it's a little bit different flavor than I'm used to. I don't eat lamb very often at all, but it's it's nice and flavorful, very savory. It's very tender. Um, it's not really complex. In fact, I didn't get a lot of that nutmeg flavor, so you might want to put a little bit more nutmeg than you saw me put in in this recipe because it could probably use it, but it's very, very good. Really, this would go along with a lot of other things too. It looks interesting and it's got a great flavor. It reminds me of the steak pudding in that it's a, a meat dumpling. It's a very interesting way of cooking meat that we don't use today. It cooks it at a very low temperature so you get a very nice tender meat out of it, which I can imagine in the 18th century with their tougher meats that it was probably a, a good way to cook in the time period. Again, this is a wonderful dish. It's really something you ought to try. It's actually very easy to do, and it's something you can do at a camp, someplace you don't have an oven because you're boiling this. Uh, so it's a great little dish to experiment with. I hope you get a chance to try it, and thanks for watching. Today's recipe is from the 1734 cookbook, The Complete Housewife by Eliza Smith. And this recipe is called, in this cookbook, a drop biscuit. So today in North America, when we think of the term drop biscuit, it's something completely different. And in this context, in this little cookbook, uh, this, this term a biscuit is a lot more like what we might refer to as a cookie or a wafer. Although biscuit still in Great Britain still refers to something very similar. So this recipe is very, very simple. It only has three ingredients but it's not necessarily very easy. So let's get started on this. So we're gonna start out with four eggs and uh, these will work better if they're at room temperature. So if they're coming out of the refrigerator, give them time to warm up. And you're gonna to wanna to beat these eggs until they're nice and smooth. Now I'll add one cup of sugar which will cream into our eggs. 
So our last ingredient is flour, six ounces of flour. You can use an all-purpose flour here, or if you want a little bit more lift, possibly a pastry flour or a cake flour. The recipe calls for continuing to whisk your egg and your sugar mixture together, and then slowly whisking in the flour as you go. So you don't want to put this all in at once, but slowly add it. If you're concerned about gluten in this particular recipe, you can substitute rice flour, and it actually makes a little bit lighter and crispier version of the same cookie. So we've cut this recipe in half because the original recipe is rather large. It makes a, a bunch of these. And in the time period context, it took a lot of time and a lot of energy to bring their ovens up to temperature. And so they made larger batches of things just for efficiency's sake. And now here's where the real work begins. Like I said, this, this one's very simple, but it's not easy. The recipe calls for whisking this mixture for an hour by hand. If you're doing this at an historic event or um, at a historic site, I'm very sorry. But you know, it really makes a difference. Some very interesting things happen to this mixture if you really push it all the way into that hour. Now, if you're at home, and you've got a stand mixer, well, hey, just set it on low, put this mixture in there and let it go for a whole hour because it's gonna do some great things. So what's happening here is this is getting smoother and smoother and we're trapping tiny air bubbles in this mixture. And that is the leavening for this little cookie cake biscuit thing. Uh, that's what makes it light and fluffy. All these little air pockets that we're putting in to the egg mixture. This may be an opportunity for a relay of people to help whisk this up for the, your entire hour. Uh, the recipes definitely said, make sure to keep whisking. Don't stop or it might ruin the mixture. So you want to keep at it the whole time. You can't let it set. So as I said earlier, here in North America, we might call this a cookie not necessarily a biscuit like it does there. We might call it a cookie or a wafer. And the word cookie comes from the Dutch. And we see that word creeping into the American uh, lexicon there in, the, um, in Amelia Simmons's 1796 cookbook, where she's using that word, that Dutch word cookie, to describe this very kind of biscuity, wafery kind of food. So after this hour of whisking, it's really taken on this very thick and, and silky texture. Um, it, it's not runny at all. It's very thick. Uh, but this is ready to go out now and, and get baked. This particular recipe calls for baking these uh, cookies or biscuits on top of a layer of flour. Now some of the similar recipes will actually call for baking these on a paper. Uh, but we found that this flour method is very interesting, that it, it helps insulate this biscuit from getting browned on the bottom. And the minute they start to really turn brown, they get a kind of an eggy flavor. You're gonna want about an eighth of an inch layer of flour that you're gonna be baking on. And the, not, the nice part is, is that when these cookies are done, you can just brush the, uh, the flour off the bottom of it so it doesn't affect the taste. You're going to want to preheat your oven to 400 degrees. You'll need to bake these approximately five to six minutes at that 400 degrees that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you really have to watch these though. In fact, she even says that in the recipe that you have to watch these or else they will go from just right to burnt or overdone very quickly. So make sure to watch these uh, depending on your oven. It might be a little bit more or less. In the time period, they've also would have baked these possibly a second time. She mentions that in the recipe so that uh, since she's making a large batch, she probably wants them to last a long time and a soft cookie will not last long. So she wanted these completely dried out. When these biscuits come out of the oven, they're still very, very soft. So you have to leave them on this cooking sheet until they're, they've cooled completely. And then you can pick them up and brush the flour off the bottom. Well, here are some finished ones. These are, have all cooled off and they're all brushed off and let's see what they taste like. You can see that there's a little bit of coloration to them, but they're still uh, fairly white and they've got a nice underneath here and they're very crispy. If you put them in, especially that second time, uh, they get very nice and crispy. 
Mmm. Wow. They're incredibly light. And very, um, very delicate little uh, cookie. Not like a cookie we would expect at all, really, because they're so light and fluffy. And really, there's, there aren't any extra flavors in there, but you would think that there's possibly a lemon flavor in there. Uh, it's re really interesting. Now, some of the period recipes actually call for caraway seeds to be put in these, and that might be a very interesting addition. If you want a modern version of this, um, put a little vanilla in there. Definitely modern, though. Um, also, a lemon, a little bit of lemon oil would give you a, a lemon cookie, an even bigger burst of lemon flavor. These are wonderful. You really uh, need to give this a try, especially if you've got that, uh, that mixer at home so you can just set it and let it go. These are a wonderful thing, especially for the holiday season. Before we get to this cheese soup, let's talk a little bit about cheeses, and specifically 18th century cheeses. This recipe calls for a Cheshire cheese, and the Cheshire cheese was very famous in 18th century England, in fact, probably all around. There's even one reference to somebody who said that the Italians preferred Cheshire cheese over Parmesan cheese. I'm not sure about that one. The cheese I'm using today is actually a cheese that was given to me by Pat Mead at Genesee Country Village. And they do a lot of cheese type uh, programs there. If you're close to Genesee Country Village, which is around the Rochester, New York area, I would really suggest going to visit that location. This is what they call a simple farmer's cheese. Uh, maybe an, an aged cheddar is another uh, similarity here. But this is a very hard cheese. It's very salty but apparently very similar to 18th century cheeses and probably as close as I'm going to get to an 18th century Cheshire cheese. So today in your modern supermarket, uh, you're, you'll want to find something like an aged cheddar or if you can't find something that's kind of hard enough, uh, a, a Parmesan cheese will do equally well. So let's get started. Let's start with three pints of boiling water. And to this, we'll add two cups of breadcrumbs. In the recipe, she calls for the crumb of a penny loaf. So basically, what we have here is a panada, or a bread soup base. Very common in the 18th century. Many times served to invalids, but sometimes regular folks too. The recipe calls for grated cheese. This particular cheese is so hard that really I just need to cut it up and it crumbles down very nicely. But you'll want your cheese to be pretty fine. Cheshire cheese in the 18th century was known for its saltiness. You won't find any salt mentioned in there at this recipe because of that. You may find with your particular cheese that you'll need to add a little. The recipe calls for one half pound of cheese. We're gonna stir this into our panada and we'll keep stirring until it's nice and smooth. It smells wonderful, and it was so incredibly simple to make. In fact, I thought this was interesting in that in this particular recipe book that was full of sort of expensive dishes, this is probably one of the least expensive and simplest of a food for the poor, really. So let's find out how it tastes. Wow, it is a wonderful, thick, cheesy soup. It almost tastes like if there's a little bit of maybe um, a mustard in there, but there isn't. It's just this cheese. It is so wonderful and smells so good. Uh, I would probably put a little bit of pepper on it just because I'm a, that kind of a person. Uh, it would probably be really good with sippets, little pieces of toast that you would put in this particular soup. Very common for soups in the 18th century. It is so wonderful, it's so rich. Mm. This is really, really good. So there you have it, a thick and creamy cheese soup. I hope you get a chance to try this one out. It is very, very good. Thanks for watching. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. While researching for another episode, I ran into this very interesting little paragraph. It's from John Houghton in 1694. Let me read it to you. He's talking about wheat here, using the wheat berries. He says, some roast it as they do coffee, and therewith make a drink in imitation thereof. And 
This, I am told, was not used only in private houses, but in the late scarcity of coffee in some more ordinary coffee houses. So here he is in the late 1600s, and he's explaining imitation coffee, what uh, coffee houses, or maybe more, more commonly in private houses, what they were doing when they couldn't get a hold of coffee and they wanted that same kind of flavor. Well, let's see what it turns out like. We're gonna make some just like that. I'm gonna start off here with maybe about two thirds of a cup of wheat berries. Uh, if you don't have wheat berries, you can go to your local health food store. You'll probably find them there. And I'm gonna use one of our little frying pans and we'll roast these over an open fire just like we would do coffee beans. So roasting these is just like roasting the coffee beans. And if, if you want more information about that, make sure to check out the uh, campfire coffee episode that we did. As you cook them, as you get them uh, warmed up over the fire, you wanna keep them stirring. And if you watch these first stages, they'll start to pop a bit like popcorn. Again, keep them stirring. If they get too hot, bring them off the fire a little bit. Uh, is, I'm getting uh, them a little too, some of them too brown, another one not brown enough. So I'm gonna back this off a little bit, let it cool off. Well, I don't know exactly how far I wanna go with these, but these look really good and uh, nice and dark. I mean, it could be that we'd go a little bit further, but there are some that are very dark. I think it's gonna have, it's just a little past burnt smell, which is kind of what you get when you're roasting coffee. When it, when it smells like, oh, you might've ruined it, you're probably about there. So let's stop with these and we'll let these cool off. I'm gonna spread them out on a plate. Now that our beans are cooled off, we can go ahead and pop them into our grinder and grind them up. There seems to be as many different ways to, to uh, make coffee in the 18th century as they are today. Uh, this coffee recipe is from John Knott's uh, book, uh, uh, his uh, Cook's Dictionary in 1733. And he says to simply boil uh, your water and then pour in your coffee a couple of ounces and let it boil until the grounds fall to the bottom, or I guess until they stop frothing at the top. So I'm just gonna let this boil for a minute or two and then take it off and let it infuse and let the grounds settle. Well, this definitely has an interesting smell. There's still a grainy overtone to it, but it definitely has a bit of a coffee, kind of an aroma to it. Let's go ahead and give it a try. Let me taste this. I'm not a big coffee drinker, but let me taste this without any additives like sugar or uh, milk to see what it tastes like just all by itself. Wow, I, I can definitely see where people would get a coffee idea out of this. Uh, there are, this might have stayed a little bit too long on the grounds. It's feeling maybe a little bit bitter, but that's what I generally think about coffee too. Today's bread pudding recipe comes from Amelia Simmons's 1796 cookbook, American Cookery, and it's fairly easy. We'll start by breaking up between a half a pound and three quarters of a pound of a soft bread. That's what she calls for in the recipe. You could use a Vienna loaf like this one or a whole wheat loaf if you prefer. Now it's interesting that Amelia Simmons here calls for wheaten bread. Uh, you know, all, most of the American colonists, especially in the 18th century, they weren't using wheat and bread. They were using a bread uh, usually done of other grains or more easily grown in the colonies, corn, rye, uh, and they would make like corn and rye bread and, and some other grains mixed in. And if they grew wheat, they exported it to England. But this kind of shows the British influence in the recipes here in Amelia Simmons's cookbook. I'm adding a pint of milk to the bread here to soften it, and then we're gonna set it aside so that it can soften as we're working up these other ingredients. Uh, now we need three eggs and one extra egg yolk. We're gonna mix that up with about six ounces of sugar, um, about a half a stick of softened butter, and then our spices, which is a little bit of nutmeg and a little bit of cinnamon. And now finally, we're going to add about a half a cup or a jill cup of heavy cream. Now that our bread has soaked 
for five or 10 minutes. Uh, you wanna make sure that it's completely soaked. Uh, I've, I'm gonna mash this up a little bit uh, to make this nice and smooth and soft. And now, once it's like that, I can actually push it through a sieve. Uh, if you're in a modern kitchen, you don't want to use a sieve like this, or she even calls for a colander to push it through colander. Uh, you could do this in a food processor or maybe your blender. The consistency uh, after you put this through the sieve should be something close to, say, a very smooth oatmeal. Now that our bread mixture is through the sieve, let's uh, stir in our egg mixture. Now that we've got this all stirred up, we're gonna pour it into a well-buttered dish. I'm gonna use something shallow, like a pie pan. And now for our final ingredient, uh, between a half a cup and three quarters of a cup of raisins. You wanna put these in last, or else if you put them in the mixture earlier, they just sort of drop to the bottom. Now this is ready for the oven. If you're gonna be using a modern oven, I would set it for 375 degrees, and she calls for 45 minutes. I think we should try this for an hour. So here it is, and this looks delicious. Now let's slice out a little bit of a piece. Amelia Simmons actually calls for a little bit of sweet sauce to go over the top of this, and a typical uh, period sweet sauce would be butter, sugar, and a little bit of sack. But for this one, I'm just gonna use a little bit of maple syrup. So let's try this out. Hmm. You know, I'm wondering, whether the maple syrup is even more than what it needs. Tastes great, either way. The texture is wonderful and smooth. The raisins have a great flavor in there too. So, I mean, it all goes together. So we do a lot of really good recipes, but this one is great. You can't miss it. This is a must make, so make sure to go out and do this one. And I wanna thank you for coming along as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. It is excellent. The recipe we're making today is a very convenient and easy to make cheese spread from the 18th century. We'll make that today and we'll show you three popular ways of serving it. This is a very interesting recipe. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like cheese whiz. It's a cheese spread made for a convenience sake. This particular recipe is from Richard Briggs' 1788 cookbook, The English Art of Cookery. This recipe is not something that just shows up in Richard Briggs's uh, cookbook, but it's a very common style of recipe all throughout the 18th century. So let's get started. Our main ingredient, of course, is cheese. The recipe calls for a Cheshire cheese or a Gloucester cheese. Um, we're not using a Cheshire cheese. We couldn't find one that was like what we wanted, or in fact, any Cheshire cheese in our modern markets. Today, we're using a white cheddar, an English cheddar, and a Gloucester cheese that was also mentioned. Uh, he mentions uh, using a Parmesan cheese as a substitute. So that's a, a good possible cheese. Uh, the modern cheeses we have today tend to be softer than an 18th century cheese, which was harder. So keep that in mind. So I've grated up uh, one half pound of our English cheddar and one half pound of our Gloucester cheese. We're gonna put this in a pan and now add just a half a cup of white wine. Now we're gonna put this pan over a nice low fire. Now that our cheese is melted and it's kind of smooth, it's time to add our ingredients. So I'm gonna start off with uh, just a teaspoon here of mustard. Add to that two tablespoons of butter. And our last ingredient is four egg yolks beaten. So as we think about how to serve this, uh, one of the first ways is to add a gill of cream while we're cooking it, and it creates a cheese fondue. And that's actually what they called it in the 18th century cookbook. Let's see how this one turns out. Hmm, very cheesy. This one is really excellent, just eating it like this. 
If you're using this uh, as a dipping sauce, then you'll need to keep it warm. As it cools, it will begin to solidify. It'll still, it'll still be spreadable, but it will solidify. Let's look at another way to serve this. Now, the next way to serve these is to put our cheese sauce into these little pans or ramekins if you don't have a, a little pan like this. In fact, this recipe is called ramekins of cheese. Uh, this uh, the ch cheese sauce, as you cook it, is very oily. You definitely don't want to overfill these pans. Just half full is plenty. So these little dishes get put into the oven at 400 degrees. You can bake these or you can broil these and you cook them until they get a nice little light brown uh, color on the top, and then they're ready to serve to the table with little toasts. Hmm. This toasted is very good. Very, very good. You can see the oil does kind of separate and um, build up on this, but it's still, uh, works out really nicely. I believe that the cheeses in the 18th century probably weren't as oily as the cheeses we have today, but this still works out it's so wonderful. It's, it tastes great. Our third preparation uses toasts as well, but before I do that, I did want to show you what this, uh, this mixture looks like once it cools down. It's still uh, very spreadable. It's still soft enough. You can work with it, uh, but it does certainly uh, stiffen up. This third preparation is very easy. We're just gonna take this uh, cooled cheese spread, place it on our toasts, and then we're gonna put these in the oven, broil them until the cheese is a nice and bubbly brown. So here these are, they, they turned out great. This is a take on uh, the Welsh rabbit. Uh, dish that you'll you'll have reference to. Uh, sometimes there are variations of it. They might call it an English rabbit or the Irish rabbit or, or a Scots rabbit, uh, but it's all very similar to the same thing. Uh, cheese and uh, mustard and, and wine and mixed up and put on the toasts like this. Let's see how this one turns out. Mm. Wow. Wonderful. Wonderful and cheesy. The wine comes in a little bit more on these, so you can really kind of taste that. I'm not sure why you can taste it in this version rather than the other ones, but I really think this is my favorite way uh, to cook these or to have, to have this as a dish. It really is kind of the most um, set, ready to bring to the table kind of a way to eat it. This was really popular as a tavern dish in the 18th century, as well as a, something you'd bring in after the meal, as the, as the very final finishing touch on your meal. This Welsh rabbit uh, cooks very easily in a Dutch oven. In fact, he mentions it right there in the recipe. So this, this will work great at an event. It's, they, they, it is really so easy and so fun to do, and they taste so great. Hi, I'm John Townsend, and I've got Kevin Carter with me today, and we're going to be doing a chestnut pudding. And these chestnuts actually came in their husks, their, their burrs, uh, which I found really unusual, and I got to asking about it. These are American chestnuts. That, I'm, I didn't know there were any around at all. No, I'd heard of like little pockets in Michigan and out in California, mm -hmm. but this apparently, this tree, that's producing fruit uh, is in this area. So I'm, I'm really excited. I found a recipe in uh, the English Art of Cookery uh, right. from 1788 uh, by Richard Biggs. Right. Tell me about the difference between what you're gonna find in the grocery store and what we've got here. Most of the, in fact, all of the chestnuts that we see in the grocery store mm -hmm. are uh, the Asiatic right. uh, uh, chestnuts. There are three, three main species of chestnuts. There's the European chestnut, mm -hmm. or the sweet chestnut, the Asiatic, and the American. Right, and the Americans were attacked by a blight in the early 20th century, right? So basically for the last 100 years, we haven't really had any good chestnuts. Right. But what about historically chestnut trees, though? Well, I, I read one account where uh, it's, it's, it's estimated that in uh, Appalachia, Mm -hmm. One out of four hardwoods was a chestnut tree. Wow. So we need to, we need to prepare these first by boiling them. You know, you can score these husks. I've found that using a masher is, is perfect. Just give it a good smash. 
And what that does is it allows the water to penetrate the husk uh, right. to soften up the meat inside. And so now uh, I can set this on to boil and it will actually cook these meats up. Right, about 15 minutes. Okay. Hey John, we're gonna, we're gonna half this recipe. Okay. I think there was enough in this recipe to make two pies. So the recipe called for two dozen chestnuts. And if you have to add, of course, that's 12. We're using about two dozen um, chestnuts because they're smaller. This pudding is actually going to look like a pie when it's done. Right, like, almost right. like... Um, like they'd said a pumpkin pudding when mm -hmm. we would call it a pumpkin pie. Right. And so now we need to to add all the other ingredients together while those chestnuts are boiling. Okay. So I've got three eggs, three whole eggs, and right. three egg yolks. You know, it called for having the recipe a half right. a pound of, or, or a quarter of a pound, or a whole stick of butter. Right. I found that to be way too much. I've cut okay. that back to about five or six tablespoons, mm -hmm. and you could probably cut that back even more. And then we have a half cup of sugar, right. a pinch of salt, and then the nutmeg, which it nutmeg is in everything. Right. Yeah. And and about uh, uh, oh, what is there? A half a teaspoon there. Yeah. And you could even cut back on that a little bit because uh, it doesn't take it's much powerful. nutmeg powerful for that to take over everything. Right. And then it called for having the recipe one and a half pints of cream, and, and I found that to be a lot too. And so we're just going to go with a pint of cream on this. Okay, these are done boiling. Let's uh, shell these, I guess. Is yeah, that... yeah. There's an outer husk, right? And then there is a, like a skin on on the right. on the fruit itself. Sometimes the skin stays with the shell, and sometimes it stays stuck to it. But and you want it to be that nice kind of amber right. color. If it's not that amber color, either it's still got the skin on it, or it's a bad nut, and you want to get rid of it. So now we have to, uh, obviously we don't use them whole. We have no. to turn them into a paste, right? Right. And I'll tell you, John, if you're in, if you're in uh, to this recipe for the historical experience, right. here you go. This is it. You have to mash them in that. So do you dice them up first and then? That might help, yeah. But I'll tell you, if you're into this recipe for the finished product, uh -huh. Uh -huh. this is going to rob you of your joy. Okay. So I so would... Gonna I, use a a modern method. Right. I'd highly recommend uh, a food processor. Okay. You might be able to get away with a blender if you keep stirring it up, but uh, it's a it's a tremendous amount of work to, to make a paste out of this with, um, with, a, mortar with a mortar and pestle. And pestle. So, okay. so the recipe says to uh, to take the, the the fruits, the nuts here, and you you pulverize it with a little bit of orange water or rose water and uh -huh. we're going to skip that as well we're deviating okay. from the recipe um but also sack a little okay. bit of sack so we can use some sack and you're going to need that to to, to make get, it a get some moisture paste. in it right right so okay. i'm going to take this go into the into the other kitchen okay blend it up in a food processor and i'll bring and i'll bring it back okay good all right here it is john okay i hope our viewers indulge us on that part this, right. That is a tremendous amount of work. Okay, but, and uh, so we just mix this into our uh, standard batter mix, right? Or right. What we right. mixed up earlier. Okay, so are we trying to get this super smooth or a little bit of lumpy is okay? Uh, it, it's going to be a little lumpy and that's fine. Now what we need to do is we okay. need to put this over a fire and uh, stir it so that it thickens. Well, this is uh, obviously thickened up and it's uh, looking pretty good. Yeah, it looks... Um, the consistency of a of, of a right. loose oatmeal. It looks like some of the lumps have even kind of come out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's they've just thickened up around them. I don't you know. know, you stirred that the whole time. Right. Uh, it was over the flame, and as soon as it started boiling, that's when it right. when it, it kind thickened of changes up. Changes its consistency. Mm -hmm. The recipe says we let, let this cool down, down a little bit, or else bit. it might mess up the taste. Right. Okay. right. Okay. okay, we've put this in um, a, a pastry <clears throat> crust. You could use puff paste as well. The recipe called for puff paste. Right. Um, and this is ready to go. Okay, so how long are we gonna bake this? Uh, about an hour uh, in an oven that's been preheated to 375 degrees. Okay, so I'll get this in the oven. All right. There it is. Wow. A beautiful chestnut pudding. Now we've let this cool down completely. When we took it out of the oven, it was a little jiggly, uh, but if you notice, um, it's just slightly browned on top. Right. That's where it's at, right? Yep. 
Okay. We're ready to That's go. It's gorgeous. So let's, let's try let's it. see what it cuts up like. Okay. Well, I guess uh, now we're going to find out whether it really turned out. All right. Mm. And definitely a flavor you're not used to. Mm -hmm. It's very, very good. I get the, the nutmeg hits you right up front, mm. and then it kind of fades out. There's, you taste the sweetness, almost like a sugar cream pie. Right. And then there's a nuttiness at the end. Right. And there's a, it's not you know perfectly smooth. Those little nut pieces are mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. So you have a little bit of texture, a little bit of tooth to it. 